Excellent. And uh, please feel free to contribute. Uh, I think this is uh, called the Raymond and Nicholas territory. <laughs> No, 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 this is also your game. Feel free to jump in, please. Certainly. Excellent. So, Raymond, just as uh, a point of departure, the, the topic of the webinar is, so what now? When and if the lockdown doesn't get extended and we are allowed to return to work, let's say the, the statistics that we've got in terms of the national infection rate are correct and that we are plateauing, and that by the 16th of April, we may be able to return to work. What then? Um, is there anything you want to add from, from a employment law perspective? Yeah, um, look, I'll happily speak to that. Um, I must say that, that I think it's far too early for us to make any of those assumptions, as, as yeah. I'm sure you think. And um, really what we're focusing on here is when when the lockdown does end whenever that may be what are the what are the approaches that employers must adopt what are our responsibilities sure sure not only towards our employees which is important towards anybody with whom our employees interact and anybody who comes into our workspace yeah so i think maybe maybe just a point of departure for us is just to get everybody on a common ground with regards to how this virus can um can infect your body. So, and this is something that, I mean, maybe before we get in there, Ray, uh, as I said to you earlier, before we started the video off, I had to go out shopping for my family this morning. So I went out on my own. I'm also fortunate enough to have access to the correct rated respirators um, for the, the type of risk that I was going into. And I went to Checkers and I went to Woolworths this morning. And I have to say that I was absolutely horrified by the fact that there were probably between two and five percent of people that were in those two shops that were wearing either gloves or a respirator of any form. So that was a person who had a homemade uh, bandana that they had tied around their face um, or was wearing gloves. And I think what appalled me the most was that all of the staff within Woolworths and Checkers in the area that I went to, not one of them had any form of protection on them other than people sanitizing their hands when they came through the door. What was surprising is that the, the shopping centers that I've been to is that the cleaning staff and the security staff all had masks and had gloves. So those type of essential services uh, are being provided with a modicum of, um, of, of controls or, or protection for them to look at. But just either the, there's a general apathy out there. I also appreciate the fact that there is a constrained access two masks. And as I mentioned to you, we're, we're bringing in a whole load um, next week. Anyway, I mean, have you been out of the house yet, Raymond? I have. I've, I've done um, two little forays to the spa to get fresh goods. Yeah. And our local spa has taken uh, fantastic measures. Their, their plastic screens to screen the tillers from, from flying spit. Mm. And and they're wearing masks. They were wiping down the service, but the surfaces between every customer um, being processed. And the security guards had masks. There was there was a high level of, of integrity from the employer's perspective, which was actually very impressive. Um, the the shop has ranged from uh, several people wearing what looked like in masks or yeah. to to nothing. Yeah. And what, what would you say was the percentage of people within the stores that were wearing any form of protection? Less than 10 Less than 10 percent. Sure. All right. So to, to anybody who's joined in on the webinar, just from a, a perspective, maybe even by means of introduction. So my name is Nicholas Graham. I own a company called Safety Risk Management. We are safety, health, environmental, quality risk specialists. Um, I've been in the game for over 25 years. I'm a lecturer for Northwest University, and I, my particular area of expertise is um, integrated management systems, so integrated business risk management systems. And some of the, the, the point of this discussion is myself and Raymond wanted to engage with people on a conversation and say, well, what, what are your business's plans if and when we start back up again? Because there's a, 
there's a, a regime of legislation which is going to apply to businesses and if based on what i'm seeing currently within the shopping centers and people going around i don't think people have the foggiest idea of what it is that they need to do from an employer employee perspective so raymond please feel free to jump in at, at any particular stage well perhaps i can ask you a question um much of the information prior to the lockdown and in the early phases of the lockdown was that the use of masks was really not a preventative measure in other words, it wasn't, it wasn't intended as a prophylaxis to avoid people from receiving mm. the virus in the form of um, airborne spray or, or yeah. however it's transmitted, but, but rather to prevent sick people from transmitting it on to people who are not sick. Yeah. If that's the case, and, and bearing in mind that, that there's a long period during which those who have the, the virus are asymptomatic, um, what responsibility is there on members of the public to be wearing masks yeah. or, or other protective measures? I think, unfortunately, that assumption flies in the face of how um, the virus is transmitted. So, um, we, funnily enough, we put out a video last week in which I chatted to, to people on what the man in the street can do, because not the, the, man, the average Joe man in the street is not going to have access to an FFP2 or an N95 mask, et cetera. So what is it that they can do? If, if I'm talking to you and I'm within in six feet range of you, as I'm talking, droplets of saliva, et cetera, could be um, expelled from my mouth or worst case scenario I sneeze so now there are small droplets of water that are within the air if you inhale those if they come into contact with your eyes that droplet of saliva comes into contact with your eyes if you inhale it through your nose or through your mouth that is a way that COVID-19 could get into your body so that that's a, a generally accepted route of intake for what we're classifying as a hazardous biological agent so that, that's a very practical way that it can get in. So the video that we put together last week just said, hey, if you're going, I'm fortunate enough that I wear glasses. And if I'm going out to the shop, I wear glasses and I wear a respirator. And I, I have to say, I think the two ideologies work quite well together because I wear a mask for myself and so that I'm not going to inhale possibly COVID-infected water droplets that have come from somebody else's um, respiration, etc. And also, worst case scenario, say I am infected, but I'm unaware of it. I'm then protecting the other people. However, what we need to take cognizance of is that now here, here was here was fatal error number one is I've been in, in the shops for obviously my clothing. I've been in the shops for the better part of an hour or so. I came out and now being on the inside of a respirator, you're quite sweaty. It, it's hot on the inside of the respirator. And as I've, I've sanitized and I've now got into the car, I took my respirator off. And because I was sweaty, the first thing I wanted to do was to try and wipe the sweat off, uh, off my face. And there I would have basically taken unprotected areas of my clothing and then wiped it against my face. Now, I, I'm a proponent of respirators and gloves. The, the, the concern that I have is people still touching their face or finding some area that's been into contact with items within the stores or rubbed against other people that you're then putting in contact with your face. And you then obviously undo all the good work that you've done within there. So we need to, to practice um, outstanding levels of, um, of hygiene within this next time and be very cognizant of all the things that we're touching. Does that answer your question, right? It, it does. Thank you, and th that's that's very helpful. I'm I'm a um, total gym phob, <laughs> so, so this has been quite easy for me in many respects. Um, what 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 are we telling our employer clients? Okay. Okay. Now that as far as their the, the, the let's say for argument's sake, everybody comes back to work on the seventeenth of April, um, as matters presently stand. Um, everybody gets into public transport or their own private vehicles. They arrive at the doorstep of the employer and what? What now? Outstanding. Great question. Yeah. So I think let's, let's first deal, excuse me, with the, with the virus in itself. So, and then the legislation. 
So what's incumbent upon the employers, they have to perform a risk assessment. Now, this should have been done well, well, please note employers well in advance of your employees returning to work. You're going to have to have an understanding of what this virus is and what are the potential exposure areas within your business. And even down to the fact that you should look at classifying the risk exposure levels of your employees and then applying appropriate controls within those risk exposure levels. So if you've got a person, let's say Checkers, Woolworths, Spa, any of those people who are dealing with members of the public, they're within the six feet range, you're going to have to take appropriate steps. Now, I mean, what, what is catnip to health and safety people is the fact that we always talk about what's called a hierarchy of controls. So whenever we've got a hazard or a risk, we know that we've got to attack this thing through the hierarchy of control. So to any employer, you're going to have to have an understanding of how this virus can affect your people. One, it's going to be either by virtue of respiration, people uh, uh, coming into contact with one another and breathing in water droplets that might be COVID infected, or coming into contact with surfaces that have been touched by people that are infected with the COVID virus. So you have to have a comprehensive understanding of the nature of the hazardous biological agent and how it's going to come into contact with your staff. So it, the, the kind of the triggers or the key legislation is going to be the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Section 8, which is the duties of the employer, Section 13, duty to inform, Section 14, duties of the employees, um, also looking at uh, Section 37 of the Act, um, you're going to have a look at hazardous biological agents. Now, I had a, a very um, interesting discussion with another attorney online a couple of days ago um, with regards to the hazardous biological agents because I quizzed him and I said, well, how are the hazardous biological agents uh, triggered by, by COVID? And if you have a look at the um, HBAR regulations, it's either where a person or, sorry, an organisation is working with a hazardous biological agent because that is what they do or it's by virtue so they are um i'm just looking for the particular term that they use in the regulation they are they are um they're working with it as a natural process of what they do or there's been an incident which is now where this is going to open up the hazardous biological agents regulations to so many other employers is where there has been an incident involving a hazardous biological agent and obviously this is the the whole nature of this discussion so now once once an organization has has looked at that our first port of call when we have a look at the hierarchy of controls for any hazardous biological agent is to try and eliminate it now the elimination component is quite difficult within this now we can't we're trying our very, very best to eliminate um, COVID-19 infection, either by virtue of isolation, which is obviously one of the controls is that people working from home, but it's not in the strictest sense a form of elimination is, is segregation or rotating workforce. So elim elimination of it would probably come into, come into play when we do have um, immunization, but that seems to be pie in the sky at the moment or or the duration seems to be so far away so just some of the practical things that employers can look at is where you can um, the employer needs to ensure that people can work from home understanding that that opens up a different kettle of fish at home because then a person's home environment then becomes their workplace now is the employer then responsible for going and putting up chevrons and watch out signs around the home because this is now the work environment so i mean that's going to open up a whole different conversation which is a conversation for a whole nother webinar so work from home where they can rotating workforce as well because what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the the potential for exposure to COVID 19. so rotating workforce restricting numbers of workers particularly around remember when we started the conversation i said we need to classify workers into risk categories so you want to make sure if you've got high risk workers in one area and low risk workers in another but they all come back into the same canteen where they, where where they're going to have lunch you failed you need to be able to restrict those workers to particular areas where we can ensure that there are like cleaner areas or lower risk areas so restricting rotating workforce uh, workforce segregation from of high risk and lower risk um, employees then if we also have a look at engineering controls or any form of technology. Now, what was interesting to see coming out of China was 
them walking. I don't know if you saw trucks and people walking down the road with these massive chemical sprays, etc., that they were spraying all over areas in a, to try and decontaminate. Um, another thing that I think shopping centers and areas are going to have to focus on, and particular, um, particularly employers, is going to be the, the rate of transfer of air within working environments. So installing highly efficient air filtration systems, increasing ventilation rates. So obviously the, um, the environmental regulations for workplaces speak about um, air rotation rates and breathable oxygen levels, etc. cetera. Um, employers are going to have to focus on the, 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 the filtration of air and also increasing um, breathable air rates, uh, and the amount of breathable oxygen. Can I, can I pause you there for a moment? Right. Um, in, in a manufacturing environment, what you're talking about makes perfect sense. Yeah, absolutely. Many yes. people work in in an office environment that has air conditioners yes in varying states of repair how how does what you're speaking about now filtration ventilation all of those things affect a highly um, air conditioned environment where, where many people would go and work now again it's it's really how long is this piece of string because you've got air conditioners and you've got air conditioners there's there's nanotechnology air conditioners now which have got really really good antibacterial filtration systems built into them versus somebody who's got a not even a split unit one of those old air conditioners that's built into the wall that uh, probably got a filtration system that came out when the arc was first made so un unfortunately it, it's going to depend on the level of filtration and the the, the technology availability. One of the suggestions would be for employees, let's say you've got a call center, let's look at a worst case scenario, you've got a call center of a thousand people and that is yes. conducted air conditioning. Get your HVAC people in as soon as possible, preferably now during the lockdown period to go and clean out the filtration systems, test to make sure that your airflow rates and your filtration systems are working effectively as part of your suite of controls that you're gonna utilize. Um, which I'm describing now. So that would be one of them. Get the guys in now as they could be looked at as an essential service for um, making sure that your um, air con systems are up and working effectively. Brilliant. So one of the things that I know as well, just in terms of those engineering controls, so one of my clients in Durban is busy manufacturing physical barriers, perspex barriers that can be attached to the checkout counter where the, the person who's managing the till can sit behind that perspex barrier. Mm. Now, you know, all good and well, I would, I would, I would take a respirator or a mask a uh, three-ply surgical mask over that type of a physical barrier, hands down, because unless you're going to physically enclose me in a perspex box um, as the checkout till person, but again, it is a practical barrier. It's a step in the right direction. So that's just something that I know. Um, so drive throughs and the McDonald's and all of those kind of guys. So some form of physical barriers, especially where employers have employees that are dealing with members of the public. We're going to have to look into some form of physical barrier between them, especially for that direct uh, respiration of saliva and or whatever it is, person sneezing. So physical barriers are a good thing. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay, so, so next, sorry, carry on, right? You'll continue, please continue. Now, I'm, I'm about to get into a, an administrative control, which is going to take a while. So if you've got a question, maybe now's the time. No, my, I was simply going to make the statement that it's, it's very helpful to, to outline those measures which can be done by employers now during the lockdown period. Absolutely. In anticipation of return. So you've spoken about ventilation and, and air systems. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. You've spoken about masks. What other measures should employers be considering now? Okay, excellent. So this really brings me into the next one as well. It's around your internal protocol, your policies and procedures for hygiene and sanitizing various different areas. So one of the things that seem to be up in the air, there, there seems to be a lot of disparate information with regards to how long COVID survives on surfaces. So I think we would be reasonable to assume that we're all taking 21 days off work, okay? And if somebody was COVID um, infected and breathed or had some form of saliva all over their desk before they left work, one, I would say, can comfortably assume 
that by the time you get back to work, that work surface should be safe based on, uh, the, I think the top time rating that I've heard currently, and I stand under correction, I'm not a scientist, was four to five days on a, on a particular surface in terms of how long it could survive. And again, I'm, I'm open to correction on that based on any of the current information. Have you heard anything different, right? Okay, so um, getting the cleaning teams in, making sure, because you don't want your employees to be coming back to work and then you're sitting writing all of these processes out. You wanna get your senior management team and your health and safety team for your business together and you wanna start writing these protocol now. So what are we going to do in terms of sanitizing when people arrive at work and we're busy importing a whole load of those infrared temperature guns. We've got a hundred or so that are arriving in a week. So one of the things that we've suggested to a lot of our clients is get your security guards before somebody enters into your premises. Put the, obviously it's a non-contact um, thermometer. So you can see if somebody has got a temperature and obviously then you can say, I'm sorry, you can't come in. And that's just a practical exercise in terms of eliminating somebody who is running a fever. It doesn't mean that infected people won't get into your workplace. Some of the, the symptoms may not have manifested yet. But so just to get back to the point, I would, be, I would be sitting down with your risk management team within your business and I would be writing those protocol now. I would be writing those risk assessments now if your organization hasn't done that already. And, you know, I, I say that um, tongue in cheek because I don't think a lot of organizations have actually sat down and, and written um, really uh, a correct understanding of COVID in, from a risk assessment perspective. Also writing policies for what to do if you're sick. You know, if you're sick, yeah. what, what's the company process? Don't come to work. I mean, I'm now gonna require a letter and people, th this could be an interesting one from an HR perspective. It'd be good to get your, your um, insights there is, am I, if I think I'm COVID, Am I now required to go and get a doctor? Most doctors don't want to see you if you're uh, COVID infected. It's like it's directly off to the hospital. So am I required so to get there's a, also a been a launch. There's also been a launch um, of telemedicine, telehealth yes. more accurately, which yes. we call telemedicine. Um, I see that, that the major cell companies are, have come on board and are offering that as a free service. Yeah. So I think we're going to see quite a lot of that where employees are going to say, I've been in contact with a medical um, person over the phone. I've described my symptoms. They have said that I should remain off work for a certain period. And, and if, if my condition worsens, I'm to present myself to the hospital. Yeah. So, so I think that we're going to see more and more of that. So the traditional approach medical certificates and the like i think is probably going to have to be relaxed yeah um, i also think that that there are going to be and i'm speaking completely in the dark here I imagine that there will be reference numbers and things sure to avoid malingering yeah so i, I trust that everybody who's listening in is is seeing the significant value in writing these processes now because you're going to have to have had them written and approved and where possible communicated and distributed to people before they return to work so that they're well aware of the company policies and procedures that are going to affect them before or when they come back to work. Yeah. So something you might have and to conduct everybody. Sorry, Karen, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. In terms of the, the legislation that you've referred to, Nick, and also the um, Disaster Management Act 2002, it requires a coordinated response, which includes the, the, the um, development of policies and, and protocols and strategies in accordance with existing legislation and any measures that are issued by the state to address the, the national disaster. And this is a national disaster. Yeah. Being proclaimed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, to, to, the, to the people out there in, in internet land, um, Nick, Nick can help you develop those, those policies and strategies. Thanks, Ray. So one of the other things that I was thinking about is your emergency plans. You're going to need to review them. Remember that I mentioned, yeah. so, so your gate protocol can be using the infrared thermometer to scan people before they enter through the gate. So people that have got fevers are kept on the outside. But that doesn't mean that infectious people don't come in. Now, again, one of the areas that I'm um, driving very um, with a lot of weight with any of the clients that we work with is segregation of workforce. 
Now let's play this through. Somebody gets through the gate. You're going to update your emergency plan to consider what happens if somebody who's now been in your workplace for a couple of days is now identified as being in infected, which means they could be infectious as well. Now, having segregated your workforce into clusters of, of workers, it then is a lot easier for you to identify to who and how this could have been transmitted. So that segregation of workforce into high and low risk categories, I think is essential for any business to consider. And then that will allow your emergency plan to then kick in to say, right, this per person has now been identified as, as, as being sick. They came into contact with that person, that person, and that person, rather than if they weren't working in clusters, this person has now been around your entire business. Okay, so other practical things, your, your housekeeping protocol. As, as simple as that's in, I'm I am an avid supporter of, of good nice. housekeeping. And the reason that I support that is if you can't get the essentials right, then you're not going to get the big things right. So make sure that your workplace is neat and tidy and any unessential things are packed away, etc. Especially the stuff that you're going to be touching regularly, that you're not allowing other <laughs> people to touch. Can I just make a comment? Please guys, do. If you don't mind. It's Brad speaking here. You, you, you're talking a lot about the workplace hygiene, and I think there's a piece that you may want to consider giving advice as you go forward, and that is around contact tracing. Yeah. Because what happens when you have a person who has symptoms? Well, a person has symptoms. They're not sure whether they do or don't have symptoms related to a COVID infection. So they um, call in using telemedicine, or they go in, and they get tested, and they found that they are, uh, positive for the virus. There's a couple of protocol that need to be included because this is a, a category one notifiable disease. The, um, the National Institute needs to be notified, NICD. Yeah. The minute they do, the company has to be part of a process of contact tracing, which means everyone that that person has been in contact with. Let's say I work for you and I notify you that I'm um, uh, COVID-19 positive, and I work with 15 people. You have an obligation as an employer under Section A of the OSH Act to, and under the Disaster Management Act, and notably under um, the regulation that was passed yesterday, which is the amendment to um, to uh, the regulations on the Disaster Management Act. It's, it's actually uh, Gazette Number Six Five Eight. And basically what it means is you need to assist in the collection of information and explain to your employees that this is not unreasonable disclosure of their information. You then have to capture in cooperation with the NICD all of the names and the contact details, including ID numbers and telephone numbers of these people. And they're obligated to comply. So when you start talking about your workplace hygiene policy and your return to work policy and your sick at work policy. I think it would be very useful to include the contact tracing requirements. Absolutely. Great point. Very helpful. Thanks, Brad. Cool. So just continuing on from there, obviously focusing on your housekeeping and then essentially once you've got people back to work and these protocol must be written long in advance, what are the hygiene practices of your business? And then going through your business and having a look at high traffic areas, making sure that you are increase, increasing your cleaning requirements, your cleaning protocol, bathrooms, canteens. I, my personal suggestion would be to not have them open if at all possible, where people are congregating and, and eating together, etc. Um, to focus on the two key areas there is increasing your um, your hygiene protocol within the business and your cleaning company, liaising with your cleaning company and also focusing on the chemicals that they're utilizing to be able to clean, are they sufficient? And then also making sure that you are creating suitable communication around personal hygiene. There's been some amazing videos that I really liked a video that came out on YouTube about a week or so ago where a person had a pair of blue gloves on and they put some black ink on them. And basically they rubbed their hands and tried to clean their hands and it took them literally 20 seconds from getting the ink onto their hands until they'd actually covered those blue gloves with black ink. 
and it showed suitably how small areas of your hands can remain exposed or uncleaned if not cleaned properly. And there's a good way of assessing the fact that you've cleaned your hands suitably for 20 seconds if you're able to sing happy birthday to yourself twice. And you have the joy of then singing happy birthday to yourself twice, numerous times a day as you're cleaning your hands. Also, people are going to have to consider all of their current safe work practices within the business, particularly if you're dealing with members of the public. All of your, your protocol are going to have to be updated. And remember, just in terms of Section 37 of the Act, and also particularly Section 13 of the Act, where you have a duty to inform. So you've identified all these COVID risks, you've updated all your protocol, you've updated your safe working procedures, you now have a duty to inform all of your employees of that updated information. And Section 13 goes a step further where you don't just have to inform, but Section 13, and I really, really like that particular caveat of legislation, because it says it's incumbent upon the employer to ensure that the employee has understood or is conversant to the particular terms that they use is conversant with the hazards risk and means of protection so the term conversant yeah. there is means and i really enjoy that because a lot of people they'll do induction they'll tell everybody about something they sign an attendance register and then they stand up and leave the room if the guys just sign an attendance register that's evidence of the fact that the person was in the room it's not evidence of the fact that they understood anything so it would be incumbent upon the employer to inform people, but then also ask them questions or test them where possible, where literacy levels allow, so that you can confirm that the person has understood exactly what it is that you've told them. Okay, so moving on to some of the, the personal protective equipment. Now, I, um, I do a lot of legal audits for large organizations and probably kind of my go-to question when I'm asking people about personal protective equipment within their organization is, have you trained your employees in the care, use, and limitation of the personal protective equipment that you've given to them? And nine times out of 10, the person doesn't even know what I'm talking about. A lot of organizations will get personal protective equipment and they will then say to the employee, there it is. And they will assume that they know how to look after it, how to care for it, how to use it effectively, and then most importantly, the limitations of the personal protective equipment. So it's incumbent upon any employer, once they have provided personal protective equipment, to train the employee in the care, use, and limitation. And a good example of that is, is let's say a pair of earplugs. The standard noise reduction rating on a set of earplugs can be anything between 22 and 25 decibels. So when you give that to an employee, you should be saying, hey, if you're using a jackhammer, which can be up to 125, 120 decibels, and I, you then put these in, it's only going to take 22 to 25 decibels off that total rating. So you're still effectively standing in a noise zone if you've got earplugs in. And regularly, I'll be driving past construction sites and the guys are jackhammering away and they've just got a pair of earplugs in. And because they don't understand the limitation of the personal protective equipment, they're exposed to a dose. So let's have a look at the type of PPE that you should be issuing to your employees. So at the top, for the highest risk um, um, employees, either a, a face shield, now we're looking at a, a person, let's say a, a surgeon who's dealing with COVID infection, you should be, have a, a face mask and then you should have an N95 respirator on. Now the N95s are, are very rare. Again, we're bringing in a shipment of them in a week or so's time. They have the top rating for a non-filtered, as in non-cartridge related respirator. And those are the ones that medical people. Now, what we've suggested in our note that we sent out to people the N95 respirators, on, there are not a lot of them. So I don't think the average man in the street should be wearing an N95. If you've got one, great. But we should be keeping those aside for the people that are at highest risk. Now, the N95 respirators should be for medical staff. They should be for el the elderly, the infirm, the immune compromised, or people who are asthmatic. So if you do have stock of N95 respirators, please ensure that you are keeping them for the people who are the most vulnerable in, in terms of this particular disease. So just, just to be clear, Nick, when you're referring to the N95, that's a face mask, right? It, it, is a, it is a face mask, so it fits over your nose and your mouth, and that an N95 is a particular rating that's given to a respirator in terms of the level of protection and also its construction to be able to get that rating. Now, I've, I've personally, just over the past couple of days, been using 
what's called an FFP2 rated respirator. Now for me going out to the shops, an FFP2 rated respirator would still be, would still be suitable. Now that most um, factories as such, if you've got uh, guys who are working with any forms of dust, et cetera, many of them should have FFP2 rated respirators lying around. Um, I don't think an FFP1 uh, respirator would really cut the mustard as far as I'm concerned. It's better than nothing at the end of the day, but I would be looking at an FFP2 respirator or an N95 respirator. Also then having a look at, at gloves. Now, just Raymond, I wanted to jump back to the value of masks, which was a question that we asked at the beginning. I, I believe that masks are, I mean, personal protective equipment is always the last layer of control. However, in this case, in my mind, it, it, can, it can protect you from inhaling um, water droplets that somebody else has respired. Um, it can then protect you if you're infectious from infecting somebody else. But one of the things that I really like about face masks as well is it stops you from touching your nose and your mouth, particularly when you're out in there. So I'm, I'm an avid fan of them. Um, there was another little article that came out the other day just in terms of the effectiveness of all these respirators versus a bandana versus please, please, members of the public, if you're out there, don't use anything that is a, a layer of fabric and a sponge. That is, I think, 0.1% effective in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So respirators and then also gloves. But then most importantly, and with gloves, if you're touching surfaces, you've got to take, you've got to be very aware of what you're touching after that. So, and one of the other things that we did, and if anybody's looking for it, we did a YouTube video on if you are wearing gloves, how to get them off. Because there's there's nothing worse than a person who takes off their gloves and then takes what is now a clean hand and manhandles the dirty hand to get them off. There's a special way to take gloves off where you, you pinch them at the top with both gloves on, you pinch them, you pull this glove off, you roll it up into this hand and then you obviously put your fingers under the other glove and pull it off with that first glove in it and then it goes into the bin because it could be classified as hazardous waste. So I, I might look, sorry carry on right? Yeah, I, I saw a photograph today of a guy standing in a grocery store wearing gloves and eating chips with him. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing, but yeah. Was that, that the, was that the Darwin Awards? Yeah, not far off. Okay. So gloves, and then also, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I wear glasses, so I might look like I'm the, the most risk-averse person, but who knows, maybe being a little bit more informed than the average member of the public. I'm going out, I've got my glasses on because I don't want to get anything into my eyes. I've got my FFP2 and soon to be an N95 um, mask on, my gloves and my glasses. And then obviously I practice good hygiene and sanitizing after that. And um, something that I, I actually asked the owner of the One Checkers this morning, whether they were supplying uh, masks or whatever to their employees. And they said, no, that they had face shields on order. So I think we're going to have some very comical pictures come the end of this particular pandemic, just in terms of what people were walk, walking around the shops with. So maybe just in, in passing, Raymond, um, I can't emphasize to anybody the importance of doing a comprehensive risk assessment. It's a legal requirement. Occupational Health and Safety Act Section 8 requires the employer to identify anything, all the hazards and risks to safety and to health. And I think that's the danger of our particular uh, profession is that many people are safety specialists. There are very, very few people within our profession who have got a comprehensive understanding of, of health-based risk factors. So and I think it, it would be a very prudent approach from any employer to identify, categorize their employees into very high, high, medium, and low risk. And I, I have to say, I even hate the term low risk. I, I prefer the ISO 31000 criteria that they use in terms of a LARP and maintain, because I think low risk um, low risk is very often achieved through through suitable um, and maintained controls rather than it, it brings across a, a fake assumption that you're at low risk, but only if you utilize your controls effectively. So anyway, Ray, that's, that's just my kind of my thoughts on some of the things that employers could do. Um, and particularly now during the shutdown and start preparing your thoughts and your risk assessments and your protocol and getting your um, ventilation systems maintained and getting all your policies and procedures up to date and approved and finalized and communicated and where possible do online training with your people where you've got the ability to do it do it online with people before they return to work 
because otherwise you're going to have a whole lot of uninformed people who are coming into the workplace and they could have had some form of exposure be on the way to work during transport whatever make youtube clips make short clips get them out to people over whatsapp start getting your communication and your training out to employees now over i mean it's the beauty of technology but make sure that they're right yes yes again um, because unfortunately one of the one of the key features that we've seen repeatedly throughout this pandemic is the spread of misinformation absolutely so, so really make sure that it's, it's correct yeah is there anything you'd like to add in there Ray? yes one of the one of the protocols that needs to be developed and considered and it's going to be specific to the workplace and it's going to be specific to the different risk um, level of the various employees in the organization is how the employer is going to conduct surveillance by which i mean medical testing and sure. medical testing can be both invasive or non-invasive it can be questions it can be a thermometer there's a range because as soon as there's a general rule against any form of surveillance any form of medical testing there are exceptions to that rule and that those exceptions um, are fairly specific and and they relate to to um, the inherent requirement of the position health and safety in the workplace and public policy so there's a whole range of things it's it's too particular for me to deal with with any degree of particularity now sure but just bear in mind that um, the function of an employer is not to test employees whether they have COVID-19 or not. That's the function of medical people. Sure. The employer has an obligation to provide a safe working environment, and that includes conducting proper risk assessments, which is what Nick's been talking about, in relation to people who are entering the premises. And, and it's, it's not, so for example, you can test temperature. But at the moment, an employer starts conducting genuine medical surveillance and, and testing for COVID-19 when obviously the infections are not can do. There's a process for that. Um, because it is a notifiable disease, if, if, if somebody is found to be COVID positive in your work environment, the, the entire place gets shut down. Yeah. And that may be appropriate. So, so there really are consequences, and it has to be very carefully thought out. It has to be, um, there has to be good information. There has to be expert advice on this, and it has to be conducted um, in consultation with medical and and other appropriate health experts. Because a mistake here could be not only costly in terms of lives, because it could, yeah, uh, um, but but also it could have catastrophic consequences for business. It really has to be done properly yeah. and well. No, very true. You know, I was myself and, and my wife were discussing yesterday evening some of the social impacts of this, and I wonder if it's going to be an end to handshakes as we know it. Yes. Yeah. Which was originally the intention behind the handshake was to shake somebody's hand to reveal that you weren't carrying a weapon. But now the handshake could be the fact that you are. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I think there's going to be some very, very far reaching aside from the economic and social impacts of, of all of this. But, um, but yeah, Ray, thanks. Thanks again for your time. Is there anything else you'd like to add in there? No, it's always, always a pleasure yes. chatting with you. Um, thanks very much. And Brad, thank you very much for your um, valuable contribution. Much appreciate it. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks everyone. Excellent. Okay. okay then. Cheers.